bunch of narcotics. Pull up in a new robbery. Living life, just got it. Chopping bricks like a rabbit. Drink a bunch of cocaine. Serve it to the dope Yeah, we all in the place to be. I said I wasn't even gonna start the show off, uh, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Uh, this is the pastor and the professor G. Joyner. What's happening, <coughs> pastor and professor? Hip hop symposium panel live from Rose College in Memphis, Tennessee. You go for Rose College. Uh, we will be taking. We have a live audience, so we will be taking questions. Uh, but we want to jump right into it. Uh, the topic of the day is supposed to be uh, hip hop culture and representation. Um, past, present, and future. What we just heard is a, uh, a song called Karate Chop by Future, uh, featuring Lil Wayne, the remix, and it's been getting a lot of traction, I guess you could say negative traction, uh, via the internet uh, and different blog outlets about this Emmett Till line. Um, there was, uh, some people think it was disrespectful to the legacy of Emmett Till as a martyr of the civil rights movement, and actually the murder of, uh, the lynching of Emmett Till was considered the actual uh, beginning yeah. of the, uh, Modern Civil Rights Movement, 1955, Money, Mississippi. Um, so I'm gonna jump right into it since we heard that line about. Uh, uh, actually, we need to introduce. There people. you go. There you uh, go. We got some fact, special teams. Introduce yourself. We got rappers. We got DJs. We got a lot of everything right here. So I'm gonna let you all start from my left and introduce Ooh. who you are. Uh, I'm Knowledge Nick. I'm MC. Knowledge <laughs> <laughs> Nick in the building. All right. I'm a uh, walk with one half of uh, Focal, Person Board Production. <laughs> My name is Gabriel. I'm the other half of Person Boys Productions, the group called Focal. And, uh, that's me. Hello, everybody. I'm Ina Esco. I'm a radio personality at K97 with Clear Channel. And I also attended Lamar One College yes, with your did. pastor back mm -hmm. in the day. That's cool. That's cool. That's cool. All right. Full life. All right. Um, audience can be thinking about this, and we will be taking questions. So when the, I guess when the camera pans on you guys, act with some sense and ask some good questions. Uh, I want to jump right in. I guess we can start. Anybody can jump in. Um, but this line about the Emmett Till as far as uh, Lil Wayne, I guess, you know, connoting or juxtaposing his sexual prowess in the bed to uh, how Emmett Till was beaten and eventually murdered. Do you think that the black artist or the hip hop artist has responsibility in his lyrics and should they be censored? Because in essence, that's what's happening in the song. They've censored that portion. <clears throat> I think so. I think, um, but as art as a whole, I think that we have to have. I think when you have when you deal with freedom of speech, I think you can always get to a point to where even <clears throat> with hip hop, where you can kind of tiptoe on that line, you know. Um, but when I first heard this, I kind of thought, and just my personal opinion, that he's completely crossed the line. And I think that there's certain things that you can say that's acceptable, and there's certain things that you just can't say that's not acceptable. And I think that. Um, I think that as an artist, I feel like they should have accountability because um, I feel like not only him, he, I know everybody know Wayne's, Wayne's a pretty smart person, you know what I'm saying? Um, but even people around his camp, you know, it, 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 it speaks in character for people around, who's camp, around his camp to say, this is not right. You know what I'm saying? And that's kind of how I took at it from, you know, an accountability standpoint, you know, as, you know, um, I think I saw a, a quote where Stevie Wonder said mm -hmm. that, um, that it's just certain things that you say, there's just some things you just don't say. And I just think that out of all the people who he have around him, there should have been somebody that's there that should have been, that should have been able to pull him to the side and just say, this is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. I, I agree with that. You know, we should, <coughs> rappers and artists should be uh, more aware of what they're saying and it should have been someone in his camp to maybe pull them aside and say, we're not gonna let that line ride. But why why so much focus on that particular line and we listen to rappers talk about shooting each other in the head and stealing and robbing and cooking cr crack and dope and selling dope and all these things all the time. So I understand it's a, it's a, it's a sensitive issue because it's Emmett Till, but at the same time, we let so many other things ride from our rappers and artists. So yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think it's right, but I don't think it's, it's right to be making a big uproar about it now because we let so many other things fly. Well, here's an interesting perspective on it. 
who decides what is and what is not appropriate in terms of the language that's being used and the subject matter that's being discussed. And I, I want to hear my sister's uh, perspective on this as a radio disc jockey. I mean, th they, they always argue, you know, people always argue that there's this invisible hand and they say you have to play this or, so A, is that true? Not that you have to call out who the invisible hand is, but A, is that true? And B, what is their standpoint in terms of what is and what is not acceptable? As far as censorship? Yeah, censorship. Yeah. What, um, what should be said, what should be promoted, what makes it to the mainstream and to the airways? Because many artists argue, I think about T.I. on um, Hip Hop vs. America several years ago that came on BET, said if we take our video to BET full of teachers and people in suits and long dresses, they're going to say, T.I. said, we can't play this stuff. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, is, is this the reality that our artists are dealing with? Yeah, I think so. Um, as far as censorship and music, um, when we talk about radio, a lot of uh, music you listen to, like for example, I work for Clear Channel, a lot of things that flow through Clear Channel is considered commercial. Okay. So when you make it to that commercial level, um, there are certain things you can and can't get away with. There are certain things that um, we kind of dumb down and censor throughout just to play it over the air because we you know, there there are do's and don'ts of what can go over the air. Now, for example, Hot 107, I used to work at Hot 107 as well. You have more of your local rappers. You can probably get away with a little bit more over the air. Um, it's just different. I think it all depends on um, what camp you're in, mm -hmm. if you're trying to be commercial, if you're trying to be more local. Um, the different genres you're in. It's a lot of different factors that go into it. <coughs> and then the program directors decide. Ah. <laughs> the program directors decide on what gets played, what doesn't get played. Um, the labels decide. I mean, there are a lot of different uh, factors that go into what goes over the air. So, so do the artists cave into the label for the sake of commercial acceptability and I mainstreaming? Think so. yes. I, I, think, I think that's the problem right there. You know, I think um, you tell somebody, you know, everybody want to sound like this, and I'm coming with my style, you know what I'm saying? person will go home and essentially be what they want, you know what I'm saying? And, 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 that's, and, and, and I guess that's how I kind of view as what, quote unquote, keeping it real. Okay. To me, that's kind of like a fad, you know what I'm saying, in a sense. But I, I, I think that's the problem with, with dealing with the... the, the corporations as a whole. It's just this big label and not everybody wanting to be them. Well, what is actually, we keep saying commercial, what's actually like, when did gangster rap, uh, we had worked on a piece together, yeah. me and Earl, um, called When Rap Became Gangster. Yeah. Um, and I always go back to roughly as far as when it become commercialized gangster rap, um, roughly around a little bit before and after the Rodney King riots. But I'm wondering when did uh, something that's so antithetical of the original uh, I guess the origins of rap music. When did gangster rap become the pop commercial thing to do? Because now that's like you're saying, that's the thing that seems to be that you have to do to get on air. So when did something that was so uh, um, uh, controversial? Uh, not even not, not, not that something that not even unorthodox. It was really underground. Gangster rap for the most part was underground. And then when did this become? You know, now that's the thing. Like we don't catch like if someone's not a gangster rap artist, so to speak. It's a shock to us. Who do you consider a gangster rap artist right now? Um, I look at guys like uh, Jeezy. You know, maybe Jeezy, maybe Future, maybe Wayne <laughs> to an extent, maybe uh, Waka Flocka, Gucci Man, all those guys. Anybody who, in essence, the trap rap to me is gangster rap now because gangster rap has always been anything antithetical of what the normal people did. Working, going to school, getting an <laughs> education, stuff like that. They're doing the exact opposite. And that's the thing. Everybody know how to sell dope now in these rap songs. Like, it's well, almost at, least they say they do. at least they say they do. It's almost like a cookbook, how to cook crack in these songs. And this stuff right. is on K97 as well. So it's not, I mean, the, the 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 program director must not be doing much of shit on, in in the, in the country. None of the program directors because they're letting all this come out. So I'm just wondering, do you all know being in the industry, what what was the changing point where this became the prototype to uh, to about corporations started making big money off of it's because it's the dollars that you know and the, and the demand from uh, those who you know didn't normally want it. You know, you say gangster rap, you know, transcend to uh, the suburban. Um, the white whites and they start you know they they want the music yeah, um, you okay. know so I mean it's, it's about what it's about what what the people are demanding the I demand think demand is there yeah. it's gonna get on but the air I think mm -hmm. as consumers we have to be more aware of what we're demanding mm -hmm. and, and then I think 
that's that's kind of you know what what goes into play in this as well. You know, what what is the demand? You know, so whatever basically whatever the consumer demands is what they gotta give the people give the people what they want is what they say, right? right? So they must want this. Which is was an ironic thing because when you said that, it made me think about a presentation that was made here in Rhodes over the weekend from uh, Dr. Jeffrey Ogbar of UConn. Shout out to Jeff Ogbar, who talked about. Uh, this, this theme of death and dying in hip hop, and he brought up this notion of gangster rap. And what he said was, it seemed as though at the inception of the gangster rap movement, if you will, what became acceptable was talking about the killing of <coughs> black bodies, but not the killing of white bodies. So he was talking about censorship from the standpoint of Easy E, NWA, Ice Cube, talking about uh, with no Vaseline, Jeffrey Heller, I think is his name, yeah, something Jerry like Heller, that. Jerry so Jerry th th there were certain portions of certain songs that had to be bleeped out because, because they talked yeah. about killing yeah. him. Yeah. But if we if Snoop talked about putting the Glock in somebody's mouth yeah. and blowing their brains out, then that was fine. Yeah. So the censorship seems to have a double standard to it, All which right. I think is a, is a point that G and, often makes. And yeah. another thing for y'all, exactly, the black body, we go back to literature, the black body has always been devalued. Right. In essence, mm -hmm. uh, the only reason we know about Nat Turner's rebellion is because white bodies were killed. Mm -hmm. uh, I was talking with a, a, a historian friend of mine, and we talked about that. Like, you know, that's the reason why it's so well known is because white bodies were killed. America has always valued the white body more than the black body. Like you said, it's interesting that Cop Killer by Ice T. Uh, <laughs> It, it, you know, in the what was the late '80s, it really caused an uproar, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it made Interscope end up having to they dropped him from the label. But like you said, and then we get we get Chronic, we get uh, Doggy Style, we get quite a bit from Tupac. Where as long as we're killing blacks in these in these lyrics or in these narratives, it's fine. But once you try to target uh, institutionalized whiteness, whether it's a, a, a a police state or a police force mm -hmm. or any white body, then it has to be censored. Uh, we got to take a break real quick. We'll be getting uh, questions from the audience when we come back. So we'll be back in two and two. Pastor Professor.